Good morning, everybody. Pastor Jan, along here with Pastor Mike Gosminski from Our Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. Um, before I open up in prayer, I just want to wish my older daughter, Elizabeth, happy birthday, and my grandson, Jack, happy birthday. They had uh, their birthdays yesterday, um, and uh, we were sorry we couldn't see them, but we got to talk to them and text them and all that. So happy birthday, you two. Um, and then on Tuesday, my granddaughter Emma's having her birthday. So uh, I want to wish her a happy birthday also. So three birthdays in February within a few days. So I also want to, um, I, I'm really asking the church to pray for members in our congregation that are going to be having surgery possibly this week or in the near future. I really think uh, collectively we need to pray for the body, our church especially, and then um, think of the needs. We know there's so many needs right now, so we need to lift up those members of our church. And And I'm hoping that this, this wonderful psalm today will minister to you and to everybody listening. So, dear Jesus, we ask, Lord, that... Um, First of all, I ask that you bless my daughter and my two grandchildren on their birthdays, Lord, and and I just pray that you give them a direction and eyes to see you, Lord. I pray for the people in our congregation that are suffering. Um, they've been suffering for a while, some of them. Some of them, it's an, a new situation, Lord. I just ask, dear God, that you be their salvation, that you be their healer that you touch them and, and minister uh, your love and mercy, dear God. And I pray for this Sunday. I pray for the word that's going forth, dear God, that it will, it will enlighten minds. It will, it will bring wisdom and it will uh, just, again, bring people closer to you. It's always the purpose of reading the word, to become one with you, have the same mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if uh, you don't have your Bibles, you can listen. If you do, turn to Psalm 118. This is a marvelous psalm. Um, Pastor will be talking more about it. Honestly, it is so chock full of good stuff. It's, it, it, you could research it on your own. And I would really highly suggest that you read it over and over again. And um, just, just savor in God's goodness. It's incredible. I think what's interesting, too, about the Psalms, especially in Book 5, uh, is that um, God is bringing, noticeably, things of the past into a song, into things of the future. You know, when David wrote this particular song, he didn't understand why did he say the cornerstone would be rejected. I don't believe he knew what that meant. It means a lot to us. And so um, we're going to look at some things real quickly, and then um, we'll pray into them. So here we go. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His mirth, mercy endures forever. Well, I was reading and checking on that. It really I crossed it out in my Bible, and it should say His mercy forever. His mercy is forever. Because what it means is his mercies had no beginning and they have no end. So in my Bible, I crossed out endures. His, he's such a merciful God. And we know that because we're sitting here, recipients of that mercy. It's forever and ever. It never dries up. It never goes away. It's always there. Let Israel now say his mercy forever. Let the house of Aaron now say his mercy forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, His mercies forever. I called on the Lord in distress, and the Lord heard me. The Lord heard me. Doesn't mean He answers us in the way we think, but He heard me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What does that mean if the Lord's on your side? Think about that. Think about that. If the Lord is on your side, I think we take that for granted. He's on our side. 
and it and if we keep going and you keep reading, I'm sorry. Um, now I lost my place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. Do we really believe that? What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. You know, it's interesting to me how fearful we are of man. It really is. I know I am. Oh, what will they think of me? If I do this, what will, what will happen? Who cares? Who cares? They're God's creation. They're not God. And so when we say it's better to trust in God because it is wiser. It's wiser. It's safer to trust in God than to trust in what? To trust on this guy over here. It, he lifts us up instead of pushing us down. Trusting in God lifts us up. Think of Jesus on the cross. He trusted in his Father. He was high and lifted up. It had, it's better for our, moral, morally, our moral compass. If we trust in God, if we're not sure what to do and we say, God, show me, give me the words, give me the direction, give me the, the signal, it's better all the way around for us. And where it says about trusting in men, I have this quote here. It says, men on high estate are generally proud, vain, glorious, self-confident, and rash. They cannot provide salvation. I think that's interesting that in this time, um, people are still supporting a man, still fighting for that man. And yet, and they're Christians. And yet, when you think about all of it, that man cannot provide them salvation, cannot provide them what spiritually they really need. And ultimately, ultimately, men will seek their own first. Men will, will care about themselves more than anybody else. In the end, that's what will happen. Okay, let's keep going. Um, all nations, on verse 10, all nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. You know, bees are interesting, aren't they? They will sting you and die, and they're willing to do that. I don't know if they think that way. I don't know if they go, I'm going to sting this person, they're going to die. But that's what happens. So the enemy can be so fierce that it doesn't even care. It will sting you and die and just keep stinging away. I mean, a group of them, not one. You, you sting, you're done. So anyway, and then, uh, and then the fire. And I lost my place again. They are quenched like a fire of thorns. If you set fire to thorns, it's going to be a short fire. Let me tell you, you push, push me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. Isn't that good to hear? Bees might attack us and there might be a fire. The fire of the enemy might try to burn us up, come at, a, at us. People might try to push us down, but the Lord, the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength in song and he is become my salvation you know those last two the last verse there 14 is what Miriam sang after the Red Sea parted can you imagine that really can you imagine a sea parting and, and watching and standing on the other side watching this and then your enemy is swallowed up and Miriam just saying you can you can look at Exodus 15 verse 2 her song oh my lord can you imagine the joy, can you imagine experiencing that? That's incredible in my mind, just incredible. And yet every day, the God, God parts the sea for us. We may not even notice. We may not even realize. Or maybe we do, but, but just, like, just like the Hebrews of old, they forgot so easily what God did for them, and they moaned and complained in the desert. Verse 15, the voice of rejoicing in salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. 
And the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. It must be important. It's said twice. We'll let Pastor talk about that. I shall not die but live. Do you know that this is uh, Luther's favorite psalm? He loved this psalm so much that he even wrote on his wall, I shall not die but live. Martin Luther. And, you know, because of what he did standing up against the Catholic Church during that time, he had death threats. And so he really believed that the Lord would protect him and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has cleansed me severely. I'm sorry. The Lord, I should put this on my my lap. It might be easier to read. The Lord has chastened me severely. What? Well, cleansed, chastened, maybe it means the same thing. But he has not given me over to death. There's times we feel like I can't go one more day. I can't take one more step. This, this, this cross is too heavy for me. But Jesus did it. And remember, he was our master. What's good for the master is good for the servant, right? Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them. I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteousness shall enter. I'm sorry. <laughs> through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. Now the next um, three verses I think are very interesting. I'm going to read them first, and then I'm going to comment on them. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, I read a commentary said that that probably was prophetic. David gave a prophetic word there. He may not even understood what it meant. But we know that Jesus is the stone the builders rejected. It's the, he's the cornerstone. And the cornerstone binds things together. It holds things together. Without it, everything would fall. What does it bind together? Or who does it bind together? Jews and Gentiles. It binds all humanity together. It binds time and eternity together. It binds heaven and earth together. And it binds Jesus, the man of a few days, with the ancient of days. It's incredible. David didn't even know what he was saying. But if you turn to Matthew, real quickly, Matthew um, 21, verse Eight. Verse 7. They brought the donkey and the colt laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut, cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before, and those who followed, cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. In the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So we see in that psalm that those very words. Um, and the other thing is, this day, when we always read, This is the day the Lord has made, it was that day. It was the day where Jesus would triumphantly go into Jerusalem. You know, when people laid their coats down or cut the, the palm down and laid it and they had tents along the side and they put their garments on it, it was an act of reverence. It was an act saying, you are the king. That's what they did to kings. Many times when they came back from battle, they did those things. You are the king. He's entering his final act. And all these people worship him. That's amazing. When we think of ourselves and we say, this is the day the Lord has made. Are we on our road to our, a huge sacrifice? Are we on the way to something big? Are we on the way to our cross? See, God, remember we talked about this. The Father had a plan and it was all taken care of. Every last aspect is taken care of. 
And here's Jesus. This is the day the Lord has made. He's, he's got his marching orders and he's going down this path. And it says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Can we rejoice when we know what journey we're on? Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There's, there it is from Palm Sunday. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy forever. I think I read somewhere that that phrase, his mercy forever, is uh, stated 34 times in the Psalms. Must It must be important. His mercy never ends. No matter what you've done, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you go, you, we think we can run from God. We can't. He knows our every movement. He knows our every thought. So just remember today that um, he took from the past. He, The psalm refers back to Miriam and the great act that she witnessed and all those other people. And then he went forward to the triumphant march into Jerusalem, bringing both together. And, you know, I know that um, my husband has done an incredible job teaching us that the word weaves things in and out. I can't even uh, believe how much uh, Jesus uh, quoted. I never realized before, but it's Old Testament. He was raised on those words. And the last thing I really forgot to mention was, you know, Jesus probably sang this psalm at the Last Supper. He sang it. He sang some other psalms too, but this one he sang. We know that. And um, can you imagine singing this before his horrible death? He knew what was coming. And I thought to myself too when he was in the garden and he said, if it be your will, you know, remove this cup. That's how we need to pray. Whenever we're not sure what God's answer is, that's what we need to pray. Whatever is your will, if it be your will. So uh, let's partake now of the elements. Uh, you need to get yourself something to drink and something to eat. Um, and what a perfect lead-in to the crucifixion of Jesus. So here we go with his bread that he took um, It's thinking of him in that last supper with his closest disciples, singing that singing psalms and, and trying to have a good time. Can you imagine? Just being together, laughing and eating and singing and his last time with them. His last time with them. And remember he knew they would all reject him. All mankind would reject him. Wow. But Let's not reject him. Let's remember that he is. He is our strength. He is our salvation. Whom shall we fear? Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, dear God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for you. Thank you so much. Help us all to go deeper, to go deeper, to go deeper with you, Lord. May we open the word. May we just listen to the word. May we really, Lord, after we hear what is spoken today by Pastor, let us get on our knees and our face and cry out to you, Lord. May we see you in the light. May we see you in the dark. May we always see you. Thank you again for your body. In Jesus' name, amen. And, then, and again, the blood. Thank you for the blood, Jesus. And it's so incredible to me that you rode that cult. You rode that cult down that street. People were cheering your name, knowing that the very next day they would all reject you. You know, Lord, it's so interesting that they all rejected you. Even the one that gave you the grave just used his money. He didn't, he wasn't at the cross, Lord. He just supplied a tomb for you. They all left you. Even the women were grieving 
grieving, they, they left, all left, Lord. But you went through it, Lord. You went through it, and you knew the Father was at your side. And we thank you, Lord, for the, the demonstration of your love for us, Lord. We thank you so much. Again, I ask for blessing and blessings and blessing on this congregation, dear Lord. Dear God, and I pray for wonderful surgeries and healings and beyond. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for some reason, my tongue was sticking in my mouth for a lot of the words. I apologize. But anyway, I hope that you heard the Lord's voice, not mine, because it had some blunders there. But, you know, when you get old, those things kind of happen sometimes. I am waiting for my husband. I know the two of us together, like Mr. Magoo and Mrs. Magoo, we can't find our glasses. We can't find a lot of things. Oh, am I supposed to excuse the kids? Yes. Okay. So let me um, not go away yet. I'm supposed to uh, tell the kids they're supposed to go to their Zoom meeting. They have a link. Um, and be prepared for your wonderful classroom. Thank you, Pastor Andrea, for organizing this. Appreciate that so much. If you want to join, if you have children that want to join, you go on to Lord of the Heart. Lord, uh, I'm going to let Pastor tell you that because I'll give you the wrong email address and it'll get all crazy. So anyway, thank you guys. Have a wonderful day and may God bless you. Amen. The Lord of the Harvest website. There's, there's the sign up on the screen. LHCFWarren.com backslash Sunday School. All right, we are going to go back to the Psalms. We're concluding Book 5. This is our third time through Book 5. And we are going to finish up the Psalms and then probably go back exclusively to just teaching on the prophetic nature of the church. We've, we've adapted the Psalms uh, to be... Uh, teaching about the prophetic nature of the church. We've been reading them now for close to a year. It'll be 300 and near 366 consecutive days when we finish uh, the rest of the Psalms in a month. We're on 118 today, which leaves us 32 more days. So uh, almost to the end of March, which will give us a year. I mean, um, we've been in the Psalms in essence since Things began to be locked down, uh, at least in our country, uh, back in March of last year. We're looking at Psalms 113 through 118. Those particular psalms, those six psalms, are known as the Egyptian Halal. Halal, of course, H-A-L-L-E-L, -L -L -E are the it's the first word of the phrase hallelujah. Hallel means to praise, and yah is, is the name of the Lord. Hallelujah is actually, even though it's written as one word uh, in our English translations, it is two words. It's hallel or hallelu, which is praise, and yah, which is the name of the Lord. So the, this Passover hallel, or the Egyptian halal started with Psalms 113 through 118. And those particular Psalms were quoted at the Passover meal uh, every year as the Jews celebrated that first feast of the year. Psalm 113 and 114 were recited before the meal and Psalms uh, 115 through 118 were recited after the meal, although there is a tradition that says 113 through 115 before the meal and 116 through 118 after the meal. Uh, regardless of which tradition we see, we understand that uh, it was recited, prayed, sung. Now, Pastor Jan's already alluded to this, but we're going to look at Psalm 113. Uh, through 118, but go with me first of all to uh, Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. And we know that 
this is where the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper. The Passover meal became the Lord's Supper. The Passover meal of the Jews became the Lord's Supper of the Christian church. And um, just reading it in Matthew, it, it makes a similar kind of comment and description in Mark. Uh, but verse 26 says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Now, before the supper, Psalms 113 and 114, which we'll look at this morning, would have been read. And then we go to the meal, verse 27, And he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And then verse 30 says this, And when they had sung a hymn, which the final one would have been Psalm 118, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And this is, of course, where Jesus begins his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane before the crucifixion. Now, what's interesting is, and Pastor Jan read Psalm 118. Psalm 118, which was designated for the Passover feast, has already described events that take place in the life of Jesus that previous week. Palm Sunday, we know, was, was, was uh, uh, the weekend before this meal. We see already the triumphal entry of Jesus. We see them singing Hosanna to the son of David. Uh, we see them blessed, saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We see Jesus when he's dealing with the uh, leaders uh, of, of the people, and as they were asking him questions and the raising theological and political issues, Jesus quotes Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Jesus recognizes that within this, these psalms, these six psalms, 113 through 118, God has laid out the plan for his eschatological purposes, for establishing his kingdom in human history, in this case, through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. I want you to keep that in mind. This is, this is as clear of a picture in real time in the life of Christ in the first century, in his final week leading up to a crucifixion that we've been doing at Lord of the Harvest for the last year. Teresa Vandervis has said, isn't it amazing? Psalms that were written anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 years ago are directing us today in 2020 and 2021 in our American context. Well, Jesus would have said Psalms that were written 500 to 1,000 years previously, Psalm 113 through 118, are guiding me in the final week of my life, preparing for God's eternal purposes, God's eschatological purposes being established. And oh, by the way, they're speaking to me and giving me specific step-by-step -step direction on the purposes of Yahweh, the purposes of God the Father for my life. So, I mean, Jesus himself in the gospel is showing us why we're doing what we're doing with the Psalms. The Psalms show God's people his plan, how he worked it out in the history of Israel. Remember, we're in book five, as Pastor Jan said, and book five is the return from exile. It's when, after Israel had been in exile under Babylon for 70 years, their city destroyed, their temple destroyed, their people forcibly removed from the land, are now returning they're now returning and they're rebuilding the temple. They're rebuilding the city. They're coming back into their land. And of course, there's a parallel between the Passover 
and the return from exile. The Passover is the first great event in which the Lord God intervenes in the history of Israel. They're enslaved in Egypt and he sets them free and takes them out of Egypt and into their land. The second great historical intervention is after Babylon and Assyria take the tribes of Israel, the 10 northern tribes, the two southern tribes, remove them forcibly from their land and take them into exile. Then the Lord intervenes a second time in Jewish history, a second time in human history, and restores his people to the land. Babylon is gone. Babylon has fallen. Babylon came in as the mightiest nation on the earth. No one could stop them. They ruled the, 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 the territory there in the Middle East as no other nation before it had ever done. They extended their empire beyond boundaries that any nation had ever experienced. No one could stop them, but the Lord stopped them. Here we are 70 years later, no Babylon, Israel returning to the land. And it is a picture of the Lord's second great intervention. Now, both of these, the Passover from Egypt, the return from exile from Babylon, both returning to the land of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, both of them as powerful events are simply a preview to the ultimate Passover and the ultimate return from exile. Jesus now, in Matthew 26, is going to accomplish the ultimate Passover, the ultimate return from exile. He is going to set the human race free from the bondage of Egyptian-like oppression and sin. He is going to pass through the exile of death and be raised from the dead and return and establish God's kingdom in the earth. So we have human history imaging what Jesus now is going to accomplish. Now, here we are, the church in the 20th century. We've got a fourth event. We've seen Passover in Jewish history, the return from exile in Jewish history. We've seen Jesus' death and resurrection, ascension to heaven, and his establishment as the King of kings and Lord of lords over all the universe at the throne of the Father in heaven. But we're going to see a fourth event. (laughs) Psalms is still leading us. It's still guiding the church in this hour. And so the Passover, the return from exile, the death and resurrection of Christ becomes a further pattern on how God establishes his eschatological purposes in human history with the church proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. All right, let's go back to the Psalms then. We'll go back to Psalm 113. Now, as we're going back to Psalm 113, let me also remind you that we are in book five. Book five began with Psalm 107. Book 4 ends with Psalm 106. We've said that Book 4 is the turning point in the Psalms. Books 1, 2, and 3 are primarily about lament. It's about God raising up human leaders and human leaders failing. Book 4, there's this turn. The the first three books are dominated by Psalms of lament. And then Books 4 and 5 begin to be dominated by psalms of praise and worship. And the reason for it is that man fails, but God doesn't fail. And in book four, we see the kingship of the Lord over all the nations of the earth, over Israel and all the nations of the earth. We see the kingship of the Lord established in verse four, uh, book four, further elaborated on in the remaining psalm, Psalm 107, uh, until the uh, end of the fifth book. But we see this increase in worship, this increase in praise. 
and we could categorize that basically by the theme in Psalms 93 through 100 in book 4, which basically say the Lord reigns, the Lord rules as king, let the earth rejoice. So, just a peek at Psalm 106 because there's, there's a pattern being established here. Psalm 106 begins with the words, O praise the Lord, hallelujah, praise the Lord. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. So there's going to be these, these several concepts, several biblical uh, images. They're going to be, uh, they're going to be um, coming together. And one is praise the Lord, hallelujah. And the other is this idea of the steadfast love of the Lord, which as Jan quoted, is forever. The steadfast love of the Lord is that God is faithful to his covenant. He's faithful to his promises. He's faithful to redeem his people. He's faithful to heal his people. He's faithful to restore his people, even when he has to discipline his people in exile. Book four is the book of exile. Now you'd say, well, wait a second, that would be one of the greatest laments in the history of Israel. But in book four, which speaks of the time of the exile, this whole theme of worship begins to emerge. Praise begins to emerge. And it it shows us this pattern, and Jesus would see this pattern before he would die. In what appears to be the blackest, darkest times, Jesus is going to be crucified by the whole human race, by all the powers of darkness, by by political empires, religious, theological entities. The whole creation is going to conspire to destroy God's man, God's Messiah, God's real king. Not a human king, a divine king. How is it that God's kingship is established in the earth. Well, in the Old Testament, it's Yahweh is the God over all the nations. But in the New Covenant scriptures, he sends his son, his Messiah, God and man, in the incarnation. And he becomes the divine and human king. Fully human, fully divine. The one who bears Yahweh's name in him. But in the darkest moment, which should be the time of greatest lament, praise issues forth from the tomb as Yahweh calls to his son, God the Father calls to his son, and his son says, I will live and not die. Now, this is important. Whether it's Israel in bondage in Egypt, whether it's Israel in exile, the Lord is king, let the earth rejoice. Whether it's the Son of God in the tomb, apparently overcome by the powers of darkness. He descends into the the pit, the grave, the shale, where Satan rules, the Lord of death rules, the devil rules. But it's in the darkest time that praise issues forth from the tomb. Praise issues forth, and the tomb becomes a womb. It becomes something that births the kingdom of God in the earth. So what's the point? If you want to call February 2021 or December 2020 or November 2020 or or, or March 2020, you want to call it the darkest time of your life? So be it. It's the darkest time of our particular history. But this is how God works. This is how God moves. He allows his people to come into great crisis, to be apparently as overcome by the powers of darkness as Jesus was in his death, only to send forth his spirit, send forth his word, send forth his son, and raise us from the dead and demonstrate to the nations that he is Lord. See, when he delivers the children of Israel from Egypt, he demonstrates to the most powerful empire in human history at that point, Yahweh is God. Yahweh is King. Yahweh is Lord. When he brings his people back from exile after having been 
put in exile by the most powerful empire ever to live in the earth, ever to exercise dominion in the earth. He shows the world. Yahweh is God. Yahweh is king. Yahweh is Lord. And when his son is put to death by this um, this collaborative of Israel, Rome, powers of darkness, powers of principalities, when Jesus goes into the grave and he raises them up, he shows the nations of the earth. Jesus is Lord. And when we find ourselves the church in this current situation, he's not going to use the United States to do what only he can do. Lord set us free from nationalistic idolatry, which has existed for centuries in this nation. He's not going to raise up a president to set us free. It counters everything in biblical history that we've seen. No, he's going to raise up his son, he's going to send his spirit and he's going to demonstrate to all the nations of the earth, America included, that Jesus is Lord, that Yahweh is king. Let's get consistent in our biblical theology and get the idolatry, the idolatrous veil that somehow has made America this 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 ultimate force. There's Father, Son, Spirit, and oh, then there's America there. See, when, when, when people struggle with idolatry, there's, there's kind of a, a, a three or four-fold pattern that, that works in people's lives. People are driven by guilt. Guilt is, is something that captures us when we refuse to listen to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, the convicting power of the Word that says, no, don't go that way. No, don't believe in that. Don't trust in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to trust in princes. Psalm 118. Jesus, your way out isn't going to be men or leaders, rulers, political rulers, powerful men and women. No, 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 no. Israel, your, 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 your hope isn't going to be in powerful men and women and leaders and rulers. The Lord is going to deliver you. Oh, he might use a Cyrus. And as I've said, he uses Cyrus to send them back. He didn't use Cyrus. Well, let's, let's, let's just say this. I don't want to get off into the Cyrus phenomenon. He uses Cyrus to send them back and then Cyrus recedes into the shadows of history. He uses his own right hand, his own mighty hand. It's better to trust in the Lord. Jesus, you don't have to trust in men and princes. Israel, you don't have to trust in men and princes for the return from exile any more than you had to trust in Pharaoh or or some kind of human being to deliver you from Egypt. 106 then is where we are. We're seeing this, this, this pattern emerge in these Psalms. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. His steadfast love forever. Psalm 107, which begins book 5, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. We praise the Lord for his steadfast love. This principle is emerging. In Psalm 108, verse 4, Your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches the clouds. We're going to see either steadfast love or praise the Lord or both in all of these psalms as we move forward to the crescendo of the final five psalms of the Psalter, 146 to 150, which just end up saying, let the whole universe praise the Lord. 
Let the whole universe worship the Lord. Now, 108, David comes back in, not as the king. He just, David just comes back in as one who's saying, the Lord's the king. Psalm 109 is a psalm of David. And Psalm 109 says this in verse 21. Psalm 109 is about an attack. David is attacked ruthlessly by his enemies. And the, 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 the curses that Psalm 109 bring against David. It, the, the curses that are brought before David um, start with 109 verse 6 and run through 109 verse 19. And, and David's accusers, uh, verse 6 says, Appoint a wicked man against him, let an accuser stand in his right hand. When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few. May another take his office. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children wander about and beg, seeking food far from the ruins they inhabit. You get the picture there. And see, David is attacked ruthlessly, and David is a picture here. He's a picture of the the people of God returning from exile. They've endured for 70 years in exile with these accusations. Ha! Your God, Yahweh, was so great. Well, how come your city's in ruins? How come Babylon, we rule the earth? How come come, um, uh, uh, your your temple is destroyed? Who, Who do you think you are? And they endure these, but remember... We've seen, praise the Lord, the Lord's steadfast love endures forever. And then in verse 21, David says, But you, O God, my Lord, deal on my behalf. And, and, and two dominant themes emerge here. The name of the Lord and the steadfast love of the Lord. Praise Yah is praise him. Praise him according to his name, Yah. Let the name Yah, which is the shortened form of Yahweh, let his name be praised and let his name be worshipped. Why? Because he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. His steadfast love is good and his steadfast love endures forever. And so the David represents now, They're saying just as David had to rely on the steadfast love of the Lord, just as David survived his accusers because of the steadfast love of the Lord, so will God's people returning from exile. So let's praise Yah. Let's say hallelujah. See, this is God's eschatological purposes. Again, Psalm 109, 21, But you, O God my Lord, Deal on my behalf for your name's sake, because your steadfast love is good. Deliver me. Psalm 110, and this is the last of three psalms in a row by David. Remember, we only had three psalms um, uh, by David in book three and four totally. David just kind of disappears from the picture. But he comes back in book five to lead the praise and the worship, not of his kingship, but of the Lord's kingship. Psalm 110 is a messianic psalm. See, what's happening now is we're moving from this idea of David and his children, David and his seed, David and his sons, to this messianic figure that the anointed of the Lord isn't just going to be a human king. The anointed of the Lord is going to be one that Yahweh himself sends specially. And Psalm 110, which Jesus quoted the last week, of his life between Palm Sunday and his death, Jesus quoted Psalm 110. And this that psalm begins, the Lord said to my Lord, Yahweh says to my Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, at the time of Jesus, I mean, you know, a thousand years after this psalm was written, Uh, going by the fact that it's entitled a Psalm of David, may have been something prophetically that he wrote during his reign. At the time of Christ, they saw this Psalm messianically. That's why Jesus, Jesus asks a question. He's being questioned and Jesus asks a question. He says, listen to me. If 
David's son is going to be the one who sits on the throne and is going to be a Messiah, which you guys agree is what Psalm 110 is. Why does David call his son Lord? See, it's the Lord Yahweh said to my Lord, and they're saying David is speaking this prophetically. David said, Yahweh said to my Lord. He's looking at a king seated at the right hand of Yahweh, and he's calling that king his Lord. He says, how can his son be his Lord? Well, his son could be his Lord if his son is Jesus. And it speaks of the kingship of the Messiah, and it also says he will be a priest. He will not only be a king, verse 2, the Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, the the scepter whereby the, the messianic king will rule, rule in the midst of your enemies. And then verse 4 says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He's a priest king, and that's, of course, a picture of Jesus. He's a priest king prophet. So then what, Psalm 111 begins with praise the Lord. And it ends, verse 1 begins with praise the Lord. Verse 10 ends with his praise endures forever. Verse 12, 112, or, uh, Psalm 112 begins with praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. So we see this inner working of praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And his steadfast love endures forever. So now we get to the great Hallel, and we'll spend the rest of the morning dealing with the great Hallel. These six psalms. And, and we, we, we want to see it, it, it. We have to look at it three different ways. How it speaks of how the Lord restored Israel from exile. There, there's, there are many things in here that refer to these psalms coming forth, being produced when the children of Israel returned from Babylon and at the time of Ezra rebuilt the temple, at the time of Nehemiah rebuilt the the city and the wall. We need to look at it in terms of Jesus because these are the six specific Psalms that are, are helping Jesus to focus on his messianic mission, the final week of his life, and then we need to see how it applies to us in the 20th, 21st century, in 2021, as we prepare to see the Lord move mightily and powerfully in our midst and reveal who he is to all the nations of the earth. Now, something you need to understand here, too, what's going on, many of the Psalms just deal with the Lord and Israel. It's, it's God taking care of Israel. Israel are his people. God takes care of his people. He wants them to he he wants them to be faithful representatives of his testimony in the earth. He's in a covenant relationship with them. He wants to illustrate his covenant faithfulness, his steadfast love to Israel, and then he wants Israel to be transformed in the power of his faithfulness and steadfast love. His grace and his truth to to look at it from a new covenant perspective. He wants them to be transformed, that they walk in covenant faithfulness as well. But there's also this theme running through the Psalms, and it really, it, 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 it gets moving in book four. The kingship of Yahweh that's being established is not just that he's king over Israel, he's king over the nations of all the earth. And we're going to see that particularly in these psalms. These psalms reflect uh, the the language of Psalms 113 through 118. Really, the the, the whole um, imagery, the language is similar to Isaiah 40 through 55. Isaiah 40 through 55, the restoration of Israel that creates the restoration of the entire earth. See, there's a relationship between God's people's success and the success of the earth. When God's people fail, the earth fails. People don't like to hear that. Oh, Why does the church have to be blamed for everything that's happening? Well, it isn't that the church is being blamed for everything that's happening, but there is this parallel. When the church when Israel under the Old Covenant, when the church under the New Covenant, when the church prospers, when the church walks in truth, 
the, the world prospers and the world enters into the truth. When the church fails, just as when Israel went into exile, it was like the end of the world. Israel goes into exile, the world goes into exile. And see, when Israel comes out of exile, the nations are drawn to Yahweh. The whole point of Israel and the church, Old Covenant and New Covenant, is as Israel worships Yahweh and obeys Yahweh and is blessed by Yahweh, then they become a testimony and all the nations say, well, we want to worship Yahweh. He's the true God. These are his people. Look at the blessings. Look at the joy. See, that's kingdom theology. Kingdom theology isn't let's, you know, let's get all those sinners out there and let's see them be judged. And, and, you know, they, we've got to get a leader who's just going to crack them over the head, a human leader, or that the, the, the church's uh, goal is predominantly negative to just accuse the world of its sin. The gospel deals with sin. The scriptures deal with sin. Sin is sin. And there's a prophetic voice in the church that needs to proclaim that. But we proclaim it in the church. The church embraces the grace and the truth of the Lord. And then then we proclaim a prophetic voice to the world. But, but what the Lord attempts to do in Isaiah 40 through 55 or Isaiah 24 through 27 or Psalms 113 through 118 or Psalms 93 uh, through 100 or Psalms 120 through 134, these groupings of Psalms, they show that when God's people are redeemed by the Lord, the nations of the earth rejoice. Now, it's, it's interesting because there's this, this, this tension. The nations are the cause for, for the demise of God's people. And God deals with the nations according to his attribute of strict justice. But then the Lord redeems Israel according to his attribute of tender mercy And then he applies that steadfast love, those tender mercies to the nations of the earth. See, that's the theme. Jesus goes to the crucifixion knowing that he's going to the crucifixion because Israel, his own people, are are collaborating with the Romans, the beast, the, 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 the political empire, just one more iteration of political empires that we see all throughout Scripture. You understand, there are no political entities, Old Testament and New Testament, that ultimately align with the Lord to establish His kingdom in the earth. It doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist in America either. There's no biblical precedent for that. All the nations of the earth, like Rome, collaborate with God's disobedient people to sentence Jesus to death. But Jesus goes into the grave knowing he's going to be raised from the dead, not only for his people, Israel, for the church, but for the nations of the earth. Now we need to understand this. So here's Psalm 113. Remember, name of the Lord... Is, is, is one thing we're going to see. And praise Yah. Hallelujah is another thing we're going to see. So we see in Psalm 113, praise Yah. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord shall be praised. Now the name of the Lord is is Yahweh, but there's this shortened form Yah that's used in the Halal. It's used 13 times. We're going to see Yah used 13 times. We're going to see Yahweh is the, the primary referent, when, when Lord is used, it's Yahweh. But this shortened form of Yah is used, and we'll show you why uh, in, in, in a few moments. But this idea of the revelation of the name of the Lord. See, this is what Jesus is starting. It's starting to work on him at the Passover 
meal, at the Lord's Supper, he begins to recite these, and the Lord is speaking to him, Son, you are here to bring forth the revelation of the name of the Lord. And it's not just a revelation to God's people, Israel, because verse 4 says, The Lord is high above all the nations. Yahweh is high above all the nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like Yahweh our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and on the earth? We see this revelation of the name of the Lord for the nations, for Israel, and we also see the Lord coming to deliver his afflicted people. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Hallelujah. So this redemption, this revelation of the name of the Lord for Israel on behalf of the nations has to do with this return from exile. Who is the barren woman, according to Isaiah 40 through 55? The barren woman is Israel in exile. When God's people are exiled, they do not have the power to bear fruit unto the Lord. They do not have the power within their own hands to bring glory to the Lord, to proclaim the gospel, to establish his kingdom in the earth. They're like a barren woman. And so the Lord is going to reveal his name and he's going to redeem his people. Psalm 114, when Israel went out from Egypt. Now we're looking at return from exile, but in the middle of the return from exile, we got to go back to the Exodus. We got to go back to the first Passover. We got to go back to the deliverance from Egypt because that's the ultimate pattern. And so this, this just speaks of deliverance from Egypt. When Israel went out from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, when God delivered them, he brought them into the land. He brought them into the land from Egypt. He's bringing them back into the land from Babylon. There's this, this um, uh, just this coming together of God's, redemptive power and purposes that take place when he reveals his name. Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion, his kingship. Now this is talking, this is all stuff, the Red Sea parting and the Jordan River parting when they come out of Egypt, when they go into the land. The sea looked and fled, the Jordan turned back, the mountains skipped like ram, rams, the hills like lambs. What ails you, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back? O mountains, that you skip like rams? O hills, like lambs? Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. This is for the whole earth. Jesus is celebrating the Passover meal, and the Lord says, Son, remember what I did at the Passover meal. Psalm 113, remember when I brought the children of Israel back from exile. This is the ultimate Passover. This is the ultimate return from exile. This is the ultimate deliverance, son, and you're in the middle of it. And oh, by the way, son, it's not just for Israel. It's for all the nations of the earth. The God who turns the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a spring of water, he provides living water for his people. Psalm 115, like I say, some tradition said before the meal, some after the meal, but watch. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give the glory. It's not about us, Lord, it's about your name. It's not about American Christianity, it's about your name. It's not about this method or this means or we're going to fight this evil or fight that evil. It's about the glory that comes to your name for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Now notice 114 doesn't have, it's, it's the only psalm uh, uh, as we're, we're in this until we get to Psalm 118 that doesn't have the praise the Lord either at the start or the finish. There's a reason for that. More than likely that's, that's where uh, it stopped. 
you, you didn't have a praise the Lord after 114 because you stopped there, you ate the meal, and then you praised the Lord, which, which in itself is a, is a picture. We may not have the words praise the Lord, but God is feeding us. He's feeding us with the bread and the wine. He's feeding us with the, the heavenly resources. He's strengthening his people. And that is, as Psalm 115 says, for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? See, that's the nations in Babylon, while the people are exiled, where is your God? Huh? <laughs> he, he, he healed others. Can he heal himself as Jesus is hanging on the tree? And the ridicule now, some unfortunately deserved ridicule being heaped on a church that trusts more in human political realities than Jesus, that, that many people in the world are saying, well, they just use Jesus. They just use Jesus to have their political ends accomplished. Truth, repent, church. We need to, it, it, it is not to us, O oh Lord. It's not to us. It's not about our welfare or our well-being. It's about the glory granted to your name as you deliver your people. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all he pleases. Where is their God? He's, he's running the earth. He's ruling the earth. He's establishing his kingship, and he's bringing his people back from exile. Now notice, idolatry is, is the issue that's brought here. See, what is it? why does the name of the Lord need to be exalted? Well, when you look at Isaiah 40 through 55, the name of the Lord is contrasted with the names of the false gods of the nations, the idols of the nations. There's a true, real, living God, and then there's gods of the nations, and the gods of the nations are false. And here's the answer in Psalm 115, and Jesus is quoting this, and we need to quote it. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. Those who make them. When we create an idol of anything, we become like that idol. When we talk about people living under guilt, which morphs into fear, fear because of our powerlessness, which morphs into anger because we're, we're, we're guilty, we're motivated by guilt, we're fearful because we're motivated by powerlessness, and we have no power because we're not putting our trust in the Lord. We're putting our trust in human creations, human idols. And that leads to anger. And people get angry. And see, we, we've, we've seen that. We've seen that the last four years. We've seen that the last 50 years. We've seen that the last year. This, this incredible guilt, fear, anger trajectory that says we're serving idols that have no power. Of course, we're going to be powerless. Idols can't empower us. And so we look to men to deliver us. Why would a church turn to human rulers when, when they have Jesus? Well, because they're not listening to Jesus. And because they're not listening to Jesus, they're enveloped with guilt. And because they're enveloped with guilt, they're enveloped with fear because they're powerless, because they're not looking to Jesus. And then they become angry. And we see that angry, that anger just continue to manifest itself in our nation and in the church. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield, which is already beginning to tie this psalm together with Psalm 118 that Jan quoted about trusting in the Lord. The house of Aaron, the, the house of Israel, those who fear the Lord. 
That's actually three categories probably of people that were returning from the exile. The priests had purified themselves. There were those in Israel who had remained faithful to the Lord and purified themselves and were not involved in the gods of Babylon, in the idolatry of Babylon, in the sin of Babylon. When John tells the church in Revelation to come out of Babylon, he says, come out of what's going on today in America. Come out of Babylon. And those who fear the Lord, that third category, were those who had slipped up and made themselves impure by trusting in idolatry, by trusting in man, by trusting in princes, by being involved in the, the, the reality and the sins of that culture. But they would purify themselves by fearing the Lord as they return from exile. So you have leaders, you have righteous members among the people of God, and you have unrighteous members among the people of God. And the Lord opens the doors for healing and restoration. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. Here we go. Coming out coming out of this time of, 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 of impurity, coming out of this time of impurity in Babylon and now being purified by the Lord and bearing fruit, bearing children. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. The dead do not praise, and here's very interesting, the dead do not praise Yah. It's been Yahweh other than in uh, Psalm 113, 1 and 9 that began and ended with praise the Lord. It's been Yahweh up to this point, but all of a sudden in 17 and 18, we're going to start seeing the name Yah revealed. The dead do not praise Yah, nor do any who go down into silence, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth forevermore. We'll bless Yahweh. Praise Yah. We're going to talk about Yah being the secret name of the Lord, the hidden name of the Lord. But it comes to a crescendo in Psalm 118, and we'll wait to talk about it when we get into Psalm 118. Now, 116 speaks of God delivering his people from death, and they coming in and to the presence of the temple and lifting up a thanksgiving offering. By the way, read Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2 is a parallel to Psalm 116. It talks about that God will do whatever he needs to do with his people, even you know, uh, uh, putting him in the belly of a, of, a, of a great white shark and getting him to Assyria where they're supposed to go when they're going the opposite direction or simply delivering them from exile. Psalm 116, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The, Psalm 116 and Psalm 118 are almost parallel. I don't have to spend that much time on Psalm 118 because Jan covered it. But think of some of the things that she's already stated. You're going to see the parallel in Psalm 116. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of shale laid hold on me. I suffered distress and ang anguish. I suffered outward oppression, inward pain. This is what takes place in exile. This is what takes place when it appears the Lord deserts his people. That's, that's, that's what happened in the exile. God has forsaken us. But Jeremiah had prophesied before they went into exile 70 years. That's why we, we uh, uh, read Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9. At the end of the seven years, Daniel said, wait a second. Jeremiah prophesied we're going back. And the intercessor prophet began to pray to set in motion the return. Prophetic intercessors keep praying for the return of the church into the glory and the glorious purposes of the Lord. Then I called on, what did I call on? The name of the Lord. 
O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple, the poor and the needy. When I was brought low, he saved me. And see, sometimes when we get too big for our britches, the church has to be humble because when we get too big for our britches, we start running around with kings and princes and Hollywood stars and, and NBA and NFL stars, and we begin to follow the way of Babylon we begin to become seduced by materialism and consumerism, and we forget the Lord. The Lord uses exile to humble us, to get us back to understanding we're poor and needy. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. To return to your rest means to be confident in who you are and who the Lord is and not worried about outward circumstances. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Look, I'm moving in verse 3 from the snares of death and from the, the, the pain and trauma of shale that lays hold on me. I've gone from there to walking in the land of the living. This is how the Lord sets his people free. He progressively leads them from death into worship. Not just death in the life, death in the worship. I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I, 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 the Lord didn't deliver my soul to death. Even when I was greatly afflicted, it was an affliction that was to teach not an affliction that was to destroy. When God chastens his people, Jan asks, is cleansing and chastening the same thing? Yeah, it is. He cleanses us by chastening us. Chastening is, the, the focus of it, the focus of discipline is didactic. It's to teach. It's to instruct. It's to redeem. I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. When the Lord afflicts us, it's not unto death, and that's the whole purpose of Psalm 116. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. Well, this is something that happens when God humbles you. Uh, we need to see that. It doesn't say uh, just Democrats are liars or just Republicans are liars. It says all mankind are liars. We've got to come to a place where we understand humans the way they are so that we can understand the Lord the way he is. Not to us, O Lord, but to you alone belongs the glory. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift the cup of salvation and call on, there it is again, call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Paying your vows means that you fulfill the destiny and the plan and the purpose God has for you. Now, Israel coming out of exile is going to be able to do that. They've moved from the grave to walking in the land of the living, and now they are beginning to call on the name of the Lord. Now, here's an interesting verse. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now, I've quoted that verse at funerals. It means that the lives of the Lord's saints are so valuable. When they die, he values them. But their lives are so valuable that he will do everything he can to prevent their death. That's the real meaning of this statement. No, you're valuable to me. I'm going to spare you. You're valuable to me. I'm going to cause you to live. I've said it before. I didn't uh, invent it. I heard it. The servant of the Lord is indestructible until the purposes God has for him or her to fulfill has been accomplished. And that's what this is saying. No, he, he brought us out of exile. He brought us out of this communal death because Israel still has to survive. O Lord, I am your servant. The servant of the Lord is indestructible. I am your servant, the son of the maid servant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord again. The name that contrasts with the idols. The name that will bear witness to the nations. The name that will 
caused the church to move from lament into praise. The name Jesus is saying. See, Jesus read this. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I'm, I'm going to live and I'm not going to die. Well, that's what Psalm 118 says. But the, the sacrifice of thanksgiving, remember we've talked about the Toda offering, the thanksgiving offering as we've been reading through the psalm. The thanksgiving offering was when God had delivered one of his people. They came into the presence of the sanctuary. They, they gave a sacrificial offering. They bore witness to the Lord. It was called a thank offering. They thanked him. They blessed him. They praised him because he had delivered them. And then that sacrifice, that animal was sacrificed, was divided up among the friends of the testifier who would then celebrate at a meal the deliverance of the Lord. Do you understand the significance of the Lord's Supper? Do you understand what Jesus was going through? Jesus, my, yep, I'm going to pay my vows to the Lord. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to fulfill my destiny by going to the cross and dying. But you know what? It isn't going to end there. I'm going to come back and bear witness to my children, my disciples of the goodness and the faithfulness of the Lord. We're going to do that too in the 21st century. We're yet going to have a meal where we rejoice in the incredible answer that God has to this devastation that's taking place in our nation and in the world right now. And he repeats, I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. We move from shale, the, the cords of shale, the cords of death, to walking in the land of the living, to celebrating with a, a meal, the thanksgiving offering unto the Lord. Psalm 117, look at it. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all you peoples. This is reminding, this it just isn't for Israel, it's for all the nations of the earth, and it's to bring all the nations of the earth into the worship of Yahweh, and Jesus knows this. He understands what he's doing. He understands what he's doing. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Again, praise Yah at the end of Psalm 116, 19. Praise Yah at the end of uh, Psalm 117. Very interesting. You know that verse, Psalm 117, 1, praise the Lord, all you nations, extol him, you peoples. Paul quotes it in Romans 15, 11, and it's talking about Jews and Gentiles coming into the church together. One new man in Christ. That's how Paul saw this. That was the fruit of Jesus' death and resurrection. How we need to see it today it's white, it's black, it's brown, it's red, it's yellow. It's every nation of the earth coming together in the church in unity, not split apart by political idolatry. A church that's separated into a Democrat and Republican is not a church that's out of exile. That's a church that's in exile. It's not a church free from idolatry. It's a church in idolatry. Set us free, Lord. And so we'll take the last few minutes. Psalm 118. Now, here's where we've got to go to this thing about Yah. It, it, it comes to a, a, a high point here, and I'm just going to look at some of my notes here um, that I made on this idea of the name Yah. I'm going to... I'm going to give you some, some commentary on this song. 28 times the name of the Lord is mentioned in Psalm 118. Do you think that's, that culminates Psalm 113 through 118 and it tells us what is the purpose of the, of the uh, Egyptian halal, this Egyptian praise, this Passover halal, this Passover praise? It is the revelation of the name of the Lord. Jesus has come to die be raised again from the dead and ascend to heaven and send the Spirit so that the name of the Lord might be met. 22 times in Psalm 118, Yahweh. Six times, Yah. Let's, let's take a look at this. The name Yahweh is mentioned 22 times in this psalm and the shortened form Yah is mentioned six times. The fact that this psalm revolves around God's deliverance of his people in the name of the Lord. Jan's already seen that, but four times in verses 10, 11, 12, and 26, 
this deliverance in the name of the Lord is significant. This is also the last psalm of the Egyptian Passover halal psalms that Jesus would have sung and recited with his disciples in the garden before he was crucified. Keep in mind that the psalm begins and ends with the word. Psalm begins with, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Verse 29, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Keep in mind, it begins and ends with that, which is a confession of thanksgiving. This is, it goes back to that Psalm 116, this thanksgiving offering of one who had been delivered by the hand of the Lord. It begins and ends with, Give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good. His steadfast love is for all time. That means that verses 5 through 28, because uh, it actually, if, if we read on, verse 2 says, Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. And we see something that was already repeated in Psalm 115. Since we see it six times in this, this particular psalm about his steadfast love endures forever, Verses 5 through 28 illustrate how the Lord's steadfast love works to deliver his people. And then here, here's kind of the, the hidden meaning to the psalm. By a revelation of the hidden name of the Lord. Yah is the shortened form of Yahweh. Yahweh is God's covenant name. It's God the Father in a relationship, a covenant relationship with his people. But Yah... The shortened form is the hidden name of the Lord. Why is it the hidden name of the Lord? Okay, we continue. The rabbis taught that Yah was the hidden name of the Lord. It was hidden or concealed because the Jews were in exile and controlled by the nation. It's a hidden name because at the time of the Passover, Egypt is controlling the destiny of God's people, a political entity. At the time of the exile, Babylon, a political entity, is controlling the, 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 God's people. At the time when Jesus comes, a political entity, Rome, is controlling God's people. His name is hidden because they're not in their land. They're not in their city. They're not with their temple where the presence of God is. And it appears that human control has taken over. And so we look for Yah to symbolize the hidden name of the Lord. It was hidden or concealed because the Jews were in exile and controlled by the nations. But the Lord was reminding them of his deliverance from Egypt, that it will happen again. They'll be delivered from the exile and He's going to send his Messiah and they'll be delivered from powers and principalities in the earth. Six times the Lord is called Yah are in twice in verse 5 and then once in verses 14, 17, 18, and 19. Now let's, let's, let's pick up and read. Start with verse 5. This is how the steadfast love of the Lord works. And the steadfast love of the Lord is listed in four consecutive verses, verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. I'm double-checking here. I said six times in this uh, passage. It's only five times. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, and 29 is the steadfast love of the Lord revealed. But after the steadfast love of the Lord is revealed, all of a sudden the name Yah emerges. Out of my distress I called on Yah, and Yah answered me and set me free. See, this, this hidden God who is, he's hidden because it looks like God's people are being oppressed by the nations of the world. The nations of the world are exercising their control over God's people. It's hidden, but Yah is the one who's going to answer them as they begin to cry out to God in the midst of exile. Yah is going to be the one 
who's going to answer Jesus as he goes down into the grave, as he goes down into the tomb, as he goes down into shale, as he goes down into Hades, the hidden name of the Lord. Because when circumstances contradict God's promises, God is still on the throne. When circumstances contradict God's promises, just wait a little bit. God is going to move. When we find ourselves in a situation and the church is confused and perplexed and saying, God, what is going on? God is going to answer his people out of the midst of their exile and their grave. The secret name, Yah, the hidden name of the Lord, will answer. Verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do to me. The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. True at the exile, true for Jesus as he was singing this hymn on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane and his death, true for us now. Now, here we go, the nations. All the nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I'll cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I will cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. That's a military image, as Jan pointed out. They went out like a fire among the thorns. Not a lot of energy to, to cause a great prolonged fire, but nonetheless a fire, but... They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. So we see the petition to the Lord. This is Jesus. This is us crying out to the Lord. Now this is Israel crying out in exile. And then we have Yah. The Lord is my strength and my song. Yah is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. He's become my deliverance. And as Jan pointed out, this is Exodus 15, verse 2. The song of Moses, the song by the sea, by the Red Sea, the song of Miriam. This is a direct reference to the song after the children of Israel, the Red Sea parted and God not only delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, but then closed the waters back over as Pharaoh and his chariots pursued them. This is Yah who did that. See, Yah is the hidden name of the Lord who yet will rise up mightily and powerfully in God's people's worst darkest, most oppressed, exiled situation. Yah is the name of the Lord. And so there's making this connection, like Jan said, a backward connection to the Exodus, a present connection to the exile, a forward connection to the death and resurrection of Jesus in which the name of the Lord will be revealed. And then ultimately, a forward reference to us now in this hour. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The righteous are those who experience the secret name of the Lord as he delivers them from all their distress, from all their anguish, from the cords of shale, from the pains of death, as Psalm 116 mentioned. Righteousness is that the Lord delivers his people. It's not simply a state. Yes, we understand justification by faith. God justifies us through the death of Jesus Christ, but he does way more than just justify us. He delivers us. That's the righteousness of the Lord. And now we're going to see this theme of righteousness. It is that Yah enters to the darkest hour of God's people and brings them forth. See, this is what Jesus was thinking and singing. I'm going into the grave, but Yah will deliver me by his righteousness. See, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. What's the righteousness of God? The righteousness of God is that he delivers his people. Saints, if Jesus doesn't deliver us now, God's not righteous. If we, whatever's gonna happen to this nation, to this world, 
if the Lord doesn't intervene and deliver us, he's not righteous. Well, he is righteous and he will deliver, brethren. Glad songs of salvation are in the tent of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord will come in in righteousness and Yah will reveal himself to his people, the hidden name, and in the midst of exile, his glory will explode and the nations of the earth will see it. That To say that the right hand of the Lord does valiantly, he moves powerfully, he moves valiantly, he moves forcefully, he moves in a military manner to set his people free from their oppressors. God's spiritual warfare. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of Yah. Not the deeds of Yahweh, but the deeds of Yah. We will live, church, and not die and bear witness to the deeds of the delivering righteous Yah in the name of Jesus in this hour, church. Yah has disciplined me severely. See, discipline of the exile, discipline of chastening, discipline of humbling God's people. It's didactic discipline. It's, it's discipline for teaching purposes, for redemptive purposes. And it's Yah. Yah is the one who will not deliver us over to death. We may be severely chastened and humbled, but not to death. Now, for Jesus, that meant something completely different because he was going to die. He was going to experience a physical death, but the Father wasn't going to leave him into, in the grave, and neither will the Father leave us into the grave, and we will be spared from a literal death. We need to recount the deeds of Yah, the God who delivers his people from Egypt, the God who restores his people from exile, the God who raises their anointed Messiah from the dead to set us free and to empower us, the God who will be with us in this hour. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and Here's my thanksgiving offering to the Lord. I got to do what they did in Psalm 116. I got to come before the people of God in the presence of the temple and declare the incredible things that God does and we're going to have a meal and we're going to celebrate together and we're going to praise the Lord, but we're going to go not only just praising the Lord, it's going to be a thanksgiving celebration. We're going to render thanks to the Lord. And the gates of righteousness are the gates where God proves his righteousness by delivering his people. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. And it's back to Exodus 15. A lot of allusions here to the deliverance, the Passover deliverance. And Jesus, who understood Passover, and Jesus, who understood the return from exile, is meditating on this and being encouraged. We need to meditate on this and be encouraged. And then it says, and Jan quoted it, the stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. Now what that means is this. When builders go through stones to, to, to use in, in the building of a, a temple or a city or a wall, they sort through the stones. This one works, this one works, this one doesn't work. Jesus was the stone that the builders rejected. He came, they didn't like the way he looked, they didn't fit in with, his, uh, with their mentality of what the Messiah was supposed to do, and we're still doing it today. The church is still doing it. We'd rather have a presidential Messiah than Jesus, the Lord, who's seated at the right hand of the Father. We'd rather have that, so we reject the stone, but Jesus says no. God the Father says no to Jesus. You're going to become the head of the corner. The head of the corner, the chief cornerstone, the capstone, the final stone put in place, it speaks of permanence, finality, and it speaks that the work is finished, the work is complete, and it gives shape to the entire building. No, the Father chooses that, and he chose it in exile, 
See, Israel was rejected, weren't they? Israel's the stone that the builders rejected. They sent them into exile, but God brought them back. The stone that the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. Jesus is rejected, and a church right now, a church that is divided, and you have a church saying stupid, crazy, lunatic things right now that have nothing to do with the gospel. They have nothing to do with this pattern that we're seeing. Well, the Lord is still going to use his people. This is what the Lord does. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The day of the Lord is the day when Isaiah 2 said, the Lord alone is exalted. All the things of man are brought low. That's the word of the Lord, church. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray. Give us success. Now notice, it's been I, 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 I. I will not... I will live and not die. I will see the glory of the Lord. I will do this. God will hear me. It's been singular. And all of a sudden, it's save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. And give us success means help us to fulfill our purpose. That's what the Hebrew word for give us success. We have a purpose, church. But the eye of the Lord, and we're, we're, we're closing, the eye of the Lord becomes the we of the church. Because I live, you will live also. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. See, it's all about Yah. It's about the, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It's about, it's about the name of the Lord being established and the false names of the false gods and the false idolatry being disestablished. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, Jesus quoted this verse, Matthew 23. He said, you'll not see me henceforth until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Until we get a church that says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Jesus. Not blessed is he who comes in the name of this president or this political party or this prophet or this deliverer. See, as long as we, we, we are hanging on to that, that's why they rejected Jesus. Because they had a different idea of what it would look like. Well, you keep on and on and on, but Jesus says, you'll not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Until we do it the Jesus way until we do it God's way, until we do it the way of the gospel, until we do it the way of the scripture, we're just going to keep floundering in our confusion, in our guilt, in our fear, and in our anger. So if, if you want to keep wallowing in it, just keep doing what you're doing. If you want to come to the place where we see Yah revealed, let's put our trust in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. When we see the Lord, when we see the one who comes in the name of the Lord, and remember in Isaiah 40 through 55, the name of the Lord puts down idolatry. God's got to put down a lot of idolatry. God's people are walking in guilt and fear and anger because they're embracing idolatry. We've, God's got a lot of work to do in the church to get rid of idolatry. But when we do Get set free from the idolatry, which is the whole point of Psalms 113 through 118. When we get set free from our idolatry and we say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, then the church, notice, will have the power to proclaim blessing to others. We bless you from the house of the Lord. I of Jesus becomes the we of the church. And when we see Jesus... When we turn to him, we're going to have the power to bless. People say, Oz, how do you see the church right now? Well, I see the church. We're like the, the disciples at the foot of the Mount of Transfiguration. We can't cast the demon out of the child. We're, we have this powerlessness, this impotency. We've got to come to the place where we say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to you be the glory. Do it your way, your time, with your purpose, your man, your heavenly man, Jesus, and then the Lord releases the power to bless. But let's keep blessing anyways. Let's bless in our prayers for, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's bless in our prayers for the world, that 
Jesus will be proclaimed in the gospel. The Lord is God and he has made his light to shine upon us. There's that Numbers chapter 6 blessing that the, the, the Levites and the descendants of Aaron would put on the people of God. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. Bind the festal sacrifice with branches up to the horns of the altar. That You could do a whole teaching on that, but it has to do with the fact that we take the, those, those palm branches that were placed in front of Jesus saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. We take that cry of deliverance unto the Lord and we bind, we bind ourselves together in the Lord, with the Lord, in his purposes, to the horns of the altar, and then what happens? You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. There's the thanksgiving offering. You are my God, I will extol you. That's actually a reference there to Exodus 15. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Again, I did my hour and 15, hour and 20 minute rambling. Lord, may divine rambling bring blessing and peace to your people, Father. May we move from lament to praise, from the steadfast love of the Lord to the goodness of the Lord, to our thanksgiving celebration with each other in your presence. Lord, take us from the place of the grave and the place of death, Lord. Cause us to walk with the Lord in the land of the living. Cause us to come to the place of thanksgiving celebration in the presence of the Lord in the temple with all of God's people. In Jesus' name, we pray it. Amen. God bless you. I like that. Uh, Linda Matthews said, we love you, Yah. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll talk more about that in the future. God bless you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.